Uh, I am Tatiana Bazzichelli, uh, running uh, a program of conferences that is called Disruption Network Club in Berlin. And so I'm really happy to be here. I want to thank a lot of Ushi and all the great hey, <laughs> all the great people of the Servus AT crowd for hosting us. And so this will be um, an event that is preceding uh, other series of events that we are uh, starting uh, to announce, announce now in Berlin about uh, uh, deep cable and the politics uh, uh, and surveillance of cable infrastructure. And uh, the way that uh, we decide to structure a bit today is also to have an introduction that is not made by me. Uh, so I won't speak uh, too long uh, at the moment, uh, but uh, from another person that unfortunately could not join us. Uh, his name is Ivan Light, uh, and we have a video contribute from him uh, that uh, I think is uh, really a good uh, starting point. And uh, the idea of this panel in general uh, is to speak about direct access and the politics of network cable infrastructure. And uh, the interesting part uh, that uh, I was starting to investigate also to create this uh, series of events uh, is that, uh, uh, of course, many of you probably know that uh, uh, Internet is not just uh, this uh, um, virtual entity, but is really physical infrastructure made by cable. And I think that uh, just yesterday we had here a workshop from uh, Johanna Moll that was really reconnected to that. And in this specific uh, panel, we are going to discuss not only about uh, uh, the discourse of politics uh, uh, related to cable infrastructure, but also the discourse of direct access and surveillance. Um, and uh, the discourse of who is actually controlling the internet and the cable and uh, what happens then uh, in terms of mass surveillance uh, and uh, uh, interference from the outside, from governments and also private corporations. And uh, so I just uh, want to say who is in this panel that is actually physical here. Uh, we have Matthew Rice, that is an uh, advocacy officer at Privacy International. Uh, Anne Roth is a neck activist that uh, also I know since a really long time when she was running the, her great blog about uh, political activism and surveillance. She's also a co-founder of Indie Media Germany, but uh, since some time now she's a senior advisor for the German parliamentary inquiry on mass surveillance, uh, working for uh, the group Die Linke. And Fike Janssen, that you probably already met because she was doing a million things at this festival. Uh, she is uh, a project lead uh, for the politics of data, tactical tech in Berlin. And so, so now um, I just want to say that for the people that are also you know, coming here, and probably some of them are living in Berlin, uh, this is the first uh, step of a series of events that then we will do at the Kunstrand Kreuzberg Betanien. Uh, the last one will be the 17th and 18th of June uh, under the title of Deep Cable. And uh, so I would say that the great way now to start is with this contribute of Ivan Light. Uh, he's uh, a postdoctoral fellow at the Mobile Media Lab at the Concordia University. Now she, he's moving to the Toronto University. And he's also the creator of a great art project that is uh, called the Snowder Archive in a Box. That is a really interesting uh, uh, portable server that you can access by wireless and also get uh, access to the Snowden uh, um, archive that has been published uh, uh, so far. And uh, he, um, I think uh, now we'll speak a bit about the general subject we are speaking uh, today, and then we will all come on stage uh, and have a series of presentation. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Evan Light. Uh, as of July 1st, I will be an assistant professor of communication at Glendon College, York University in Toronto. Many thanks to Tatiana and Ushi for inviting me to be with you, and I'm terribly sorry I can't be there in person. The title of my talk today is Undersea Cable Surveillance Extraction and the Future of Surveillance Activism. 
Today, I'll be giving a brief introduction to the panel, uh, looking at undersea cables, what has come up in the news over the last two years in terms of undersea cables and mass surveillance. We'll look a bit at submarine cable or undersea cable infrastructure, what's known as the GCHQ master list, which has come out of the Snowden documents. We'll look at some of the compromised cables, cables which have been compromised by the NSA or GCHQ. I'll touch on a couple potential links that these submarine cable companies um, have with extractive industries. And finally, we'll look at obstacles to surveillance reform and what we can learn from environmental movements. This will all be quite quick, a quick introduction to the longer panel. So begin with in August 2015, this past August, it, the New York Times broke a huge story detailing how AT&T helped the United States National Security Agency spy on the internet in general, um, a plan that goes back to the mid 80s, whereby the NSA had direct access to AT&T cables, AT&T networks across the world. A um, New York Times journalist investigating the Snowden documents noticed that a codenamed cable off the coast of a country in Southeast Asia had broken at a certain time period when one of at and cables broke at that exact same point and realized that, oh, this code name is at and and was able to track back the collusion between these two groups, at and and the NSA, to 1985. Other stories in the recent news um, in the UK and in Germany there's been coverage of GCHQ's work with Vodafone's subsidiary Cable and Wireless. Cable and Wireless were an independent company until 2011 when they started to be broken up. <coughs> Vodafone acquired one of their units, Cable and Wireless Worldwide, which operated extensive fiber optic networks around the world, some of which land in the UK and have been documented as being really in the hands of the GCHQ, the Global Communications Headquarters in the UK, the version of the NSA. Channel 4 in 2014 did a wonderful 10 minute documentary um, looking in depth at how this works and conducting interviews with representatives of Vodafone. Definitely worth checking out. This is a map of the world's submarine cable um, infrastructure today from a company called Telegeography, which maintains a database on all current things fiber optic and undersea. As you can see, it's a pretty extensive network crossing most of the world's oceans, connecting the, all the continents together with the exception of Antarctica. Today, there are 351 cables operating worldwide and 50 other planned cables. In 2009, GCHQ had access to at least 63 cables that were trans transiting through the UK. Today, in 2016, due to either mergers and acquisitions or the just retirement of these cables, there are today 48 cables that land in the UK that, according to the Snowden documents, um, GCHQ still has access to. Today as well, 64 cables land in the United States. So of these 351 around the world, a pretty huge portion land in the US or the UK and are thus subjected to mass surveillance by the NSA or GCHQ. A lot of this knowledge has come out of the GCHQ master list, a document revealed in the Snowden documents, um, now a 56 page or so list of cables to which GCHQ had access to in 2009. You see here an example of one of these cables, uh, AC1, Atlantic Crossing 1. So we can see at the time it was owned by GX, which is Global Crossing. Their code name for GCHQ was Pinage. In 2011, Global Crossing was bought by the company Level 3, who was a large American corporation involved in undersea cables and transit, but also a regular collaborator with GCHQ. 
I'll quickly touch here on some of the compromised cables. Cables can be compromised in a few different ways. First, through unauthorized access or tapping of the cables. Second, through direct collaboration with cable owners. In these cases, from the GCHU master list, we can see that AT&T, Cable and Wireless, now Vodafone, Global Crossing, which has now been sucked into level three. Level three, British Telecom, Verizon, Viatel, and Interroot have all been noted by GCHU as being collaborating um, partners. And then a third way is almost by infection, I would say, where a number of cables are operated not by one company, but by consortiums. So by trusting a commercial partner that is in turn collaborating with the NSA or GCSQ, a potential 81 companies could be affected by um, these, these various forms of collaboration between intelligence agencies and this set of um, cable providers, AT&T, cable and wireless, et cetera. To give you a quick summary of what this means, AT&T, a proven collaborator with the NSA going back to 1985, is the direct owner of 25 of these 351 cable systems around the world. They have 1.1 million fiber root miles of fiber in 182 countries, and they're the upstream provider for 71 Fortune 500 companies, including Walmart, Royal Dutch Shell, General Motors, General Electric, J.P. Morgan Chase, Siemens, Boeing, Dow Chemical, Lockheed Martin, Honeywell International, BAE, Northrop Grumman, and Raytheon. So AT&T is basically entrusted with the providing private access to telecommunications and to the internet by a number of weapons manufacturers, by banks, etc. Vodafone, in turn, in 2012, acquired cable and wireless worldwide. Today has over a million kilometers of undersea cables in 150 countries. They also have a 98% global satellite coverage. They're direct owners of 18 cable systems and have capacity on 80 other cable systems. And we're a partner in nine compromised cables on the GCSG master list. This is a map from AT&T, uh, AT&T's website documenting their wholesale fiber map. You can see it's quite extensive. And this is Vodafone's. Now, some work that I'll briefly mention, but that I'm not going to get into in this talk. I've been starting to see some interesting overlap between um, the members of boards of directors of telecoms that have been shown to collaborate with the NSA and GCHQ and with extractive resource companies, such as mining corporations, coal energy producers in the United States, petroleum producers, people who either are currently still involved at a very high level as members of the board of directors or CEOs of telecoms and of extractive resource companies, or pre have previously been in executive positions in extractive resource companies, such as Royal Dutch Shell, and companies that typically were subject to a lot of public attention due to human rights abuses, but which continued to march on and really suffered no major repercussions. Today, a number of these individuals are in positions of power in telecoms that despite the Snowden documents, despite revelations of mass surveillance and cooperation in mass surveillance, these companies really have seen no, um, no effect to their bottom line, no political pressure, of some real palpable sort affecting the way they operate. Which brings me to some obstacles to surveillance reform. One of these is the human right to privacy. How, I think in order to begin to engage in meaningful surveillance reform, we need to think about how you define the human right to privacy in an accessible way. How do you make this abstract thing something tangible, something people understand? One of the ways we need to do this is how do you, is to illustrate harm. How do you illustrate that surveillance is harmful? And how do you, thirdly, how do we make surveillance a political rather than a partisan issue? How do you make surveillance or the right to privacy something that is attractive to all political parties, something that is actually a human, a human right and can be, I guess, mobilized as such? 
And finally, I just want to quickly touch on a few things we can learn from environmental movements. One is different tactics. The environmental movements over the last 20, 30 years have engaged in a number of different tactics to fight their battles, be it shareholder activism, boycotts, and popular campaigns. They are very good at appealing to the broader good, defining their goal, their values, as something that is important for society and is not divisive. Thirdly, they're quite well practiced at making the abstract something real, something people can understand without thinking too hard. And finally, they're able to situate a specific sort of reform and a broader push for political reform. How do we take the problem of surveillance, the problem of violation of the human right to privacy, and make it a tool for in like, broadening democratic reform of political systems. That's all for today. Thank you very much, Tatiana and Ushi, again for inviting me. I'm really sorry I couldn't be here. Thank you to the panel. I'm hoping to meet all of you in the future. If you'd like to get in touch with me, please drop me a line. My email, evan at theotherthing.org. Thank you very much. So now I will call you all on stage. Is this working? Yes. Maybe for now we... Is working? Okay. Uh, maybe for now we can just leave the other image. Uh, okay. The general one. Mm -hmm. Um, great, so um, now we will start uh, with the first uh, round uh, of discussion and uh, we saw to start with Matthew Rice that I think uh, is also connecting really well with what Ivan was saying. Uh, you will bring more uh, UK perspective uh, from the privacy international uh, work on direct access um, and I think then we will go on on the floor with Anne and then uh, Fike. Um, yeah, thank you all for being here and for having me. Um, so I guess I could actually pick, off, pick up exactly where Evan left off in kind of discussing um, those companies that were collaborating and what Privacy International tried to do mm -hmm. to hold those companies to account. Um, so there is a set of principles called the uh, Principles for Multinational Enterprises of Business and Human Rights um, from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development also known as the Rich Countries Club. Um, we sometimes call it that. They, we've used these guidelines in the past. They have like an individual complaints mechanism. We've used it in the past to actually attack a German company, um, a British German company called Gamma, who are selling um, intrusion software called FinFisher. Um, and we've won on this for companies that are facilitating human rights abuses. So we took the stories uh, from Sudeutsche and The Guardian um, and we, we took complaints against AT&T, Vodafone, Level 3, BT, Verizon Enterprise, and Interroute um, for their facilitation of the Tempora program. The Tempora program, um, I think Evan touched on a little bit, that was the direct access to undersea cables as they landed on the UK mainland. Um, and because the UK is such a pivotal, pivotal um, geographic position, um, that's a hell of a lot of everybody's data, particularly in, in mainland Europe. Um, so we took the case, we said these companies were, um, were failing to responsibly operate in this space, that they were not pushing back against um, requests that were obviously um, an egregious human rights abuses, um, that they were not requesting appropriate uh, documentation, and that we just kept running down that they were, just, they were just running away from the obligations and the responsibilities that they should have. Um, and we sent this to what's called the national contact point, which is the, the kind of like the person to ass that assesses whether or not there's a, a case to be answered for. So they said, yeah, you guys have got something here. Like certainly if there's a, if there's a program that's operating at this scale and is involving companies um, to this level, that's a, a, a human rights abuse and, and you could certainly take that. Unfortunately, we don't think that the Guardian and the Sedoja articles were sufficient in showing the link between those companies and those programs, um, which we try to challenge, but there's no appeals process in this kind of space. And so 
we kind of just got scotched there. Um, what it doesn't say is that these companies don't have obligations. What the judgment was that we just can't say that it was exactly those companies um, in the NCP's mind, which I think is a bullshit, if you ask me. But um, we're never, we're never, uh, we're never too disheartened. We move on to the European Court of Human Rights, um, where we're actually challenging the whole domestic legislation or the whole domestic framework in the UK, which is called the, Regula the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, um, and saying that this facilitated such a ridiculous program like Tempora that gave such a huge amount of access to millions upon millions of people's communications that it sufficiently just lacked any level of safeguard that, that should have been there. Um, and so that doesn't necessarily point itself directly towards like what is Vodafone supposed to do about this? What do we think like Verizon's obligations are um, on the face of it? But there was a case at the end of last year called Zakharov. Um, I don't know if anybody else heard of Zakharov. It's this Russian case, um, a Russian publisher. Uh, took the Russian state surveillance infrastructure um, and their legislative framework to the European court and it was found to be wholly lacking um, and completely um, not sufficient to, to sufficiently protect the human rights of, of Russian nationals. And one of the aspects that the court said was that um, there was a direct access framework operating in Russia at the time, that like law enforcement would just turn up and they would just take whatever information they wanted, or they would just hook in any kind of uh, probe or tap that they wanted to. And there was effectively no uh, interface with the, um, with the communication service providers. And to me, that's what direct access means. I probably should have opened up by saying, in trying to define what we mean by direct access. It means, to me, that the state has unfettered access, completely unfiltered, no friction involved, that the communication service provider is not involved at any point in the process. That's what direct access is. They've, they've ran away from their responsibilities or they've been forced to give up their space. Um, and the European Court said that having this kind of framework in place, having that kind of, that kind of circumvention of companies um, was not sufficient. You need to be able to, the communication service providers need to get this request, and they need to be able to push back against the request. Um, and so with that in mind, I think we're, we're, we might be in for something interesting. I don't know when the, uh, we don't know when the court is gonna ask for the hearings to, to take place in the next stage, but we might hear some very, very strong words around what we should expect from, say, T-Mobile, or whoever the, the, your biggest provider in your country is, in terms of their responsibilities to you. And ultimately, that's what we're talking about here. It's not necessarily our relationship with the state, it's our relationship with our providers and the responsibilities that they hold to us. Um, and we've seen what happens in countries where direct access is being operated in a domestic framework. So um, if we look at like Macedonia, for instance, Macedonia last year had a scandal that brought down their government um, that involved a revelation that 20,000 people, 20,000 activists from Supreme Court justices to journalists to just kind of aggravators in the space were being tapped. And they were being tapped by the intelligence agency that was helpfully being run by the president's cousin because you got to keep it in the family if you want to run those kind of things. Um, that was a direct access framework. And the reason why it was so massive and the reason why there was so much access given was because Magyar Telecom or, and uh, Medansky Telecom were not, were not providing any friction, were not pushing back against the government because the government said, we have this order, it says give us access, we have this room, you guys just get lost. Um, and that's not good enough and companies, in my mind, can't begin to operate like, operate like that. And, then, and that when we see these kind of instances, um, we have to speak out. We have to speak out as customers to say, we expect something of you. Um, and I think that's one of the, the questions that the way I really want to get to is, are these, are these providers political actors? Do we consider them actors in the space that can, we can speak to, that we can change their policies, that we can, we can force them into a different way of, of, of acting. Because up to now, they've been treated as kind of passive observers who you pay a monthly subscription to and you just hope that they don't give away all your data. Um, and that seems like a kind of lazy, a lazy ass excuse that we're running around. Um, actually, if we begin to treat them like 
political actors, like representatives that we should be able to hold to account in just the same way that we would try and hold any elected politician to account, we're suddenly in a more interesting space where we can talk about how you campaign towards these people, um, how, you, how you run direct action against these people. Do we all switch off and stop using Vodafone? It's very difficult to do that kind of stuff, but we, if we begin to think outside the box a little more and we begin to treat these guys as not just providers of communication but guardians of our rights, I think we're in a more interesting space. And we've spoken to telco providers about this. We've asked, like, can you give us your policies around direct access? Um, and privately, they're saying, no, we don't like it, but we've got to obey the law of the land, um, which I think is a bullshit like, argument. If the law of the land is you give up everything that you have when you arrive, um, it's a terrible space. And it just goes against exactly what these companies do a lot of the time. They're lobbying against competition. They want more deregulation so that they can have better services and they can buy more small subsidiaries in your, com in your country so that they can sell you more services. They lobby to change competition laws so they can get access. Why the hell do they not try and decide that they want to lobby to try and protect their, their, their customers' rights? Um, I just think we, we begin to like waking up and start to look at them as these people that we can speak to, that we can hold to account a bit more. Um, I don't know, we could have a bit more fun than just thinking that all we're up against is the UK, the US, um, and that kind of like dichotomy. Um, but that's, that's what I'm interested in discussing with, with you all today. Um, what can we do to make them political? Thank you. Maybe I, I just do a question in between, because I think that um, perhaps something that could be also interesting for the public if, is uh, if you could uh, explain a bit more uh, what uh, the Tempora uh, discourse was about and then how really the surveillance happened. Because, for example, before we were also speaking about is actually surveillance really happening on the submarine cables or on the landing sites. And I think all these aspects are really important to understand because uh, you know, they also imply a certain knowledge of infrastructure that perhaps not all the people have. So maybe you can say something a bit more? Sure. It'd be cool if we had the map up. Unless, Fika, are you going to speak about that same infrastructure at some point? I'm going to show the infrastructure. You're going to show the infrastructure. Am I just stepping on you if I talk about it? No. Okay. I don't want to be stepping on you. That's, I'm scared of that. Um, so the Tempora program was um, also known as Mastering the Internet. Um, and that wasn't an over-exaggeration. That was GCHQ's plan to have access to as much data that can be that is running through um, the cables that are landing in the UK as possible. Um, and if we go back to that telegeography slide that Evan showed and that Fico will bring up again, um, sometimes we just treat things as because our immediate interaction with our devices is that things are wireless and that they're wireless for a while, actually they become wired very quickly. Um, and whole cities and then whole regions or states and then whole countries and then whole regions suddenly become, or continents suddenly become this very, very wired in very, very centralized spaces. So from, from mainland Europe, there were, I think, there was, there was about 64 cables that were landing in the, the UK, and I think, uh, on last guess, it was about um, 30 to 40 of them were, were coming out of mainland Europe, and then others were coming out of different continents like, like Africa. Um, these cables run down the, like, the floor of the sea, and then they come up and they pop up onto the island, and if you love you know, UK geography, if anybody's in Cornwall at any time, and you want to take a trip to one of these landing sites, if you go to a place called Bude, um, what you will see is a big, massive, faceless structure, and you can say, oh, that's where most of Europe's data goes before it heads towards the Facebook servers or the Google servers. Um, and so that massive, faceless structure, the one that you can only see is like a speck in the distance, um, that is where GCHQ were placing taps. That is the access that they were getting. Um, the numbers escaped me, but we were talking about hundreds of millions of millions of pieces of data, something like that. Um, it was a huge amount, and it was, it was fully trying to master that skill. Um, and that's not easy, but they were very successful at doing it. They were able to hold, um, they were able to buffer, I think it was like 85% of the traffic that they collected for at least three days, um, and then they would scoop up um, 
they would scoop up the, the aspects that they wanted. But 85% for three days is a significant amount of data that was being passed through. So we're talking like gargantuan levels. But I'm sure Anne has a, a pretty good assessment from her experience in the, in the, in the investigations as well. So now I pass to Anne Roth, and she will also bring the prospecting from the German side working at the inquiry. Thank you very much. Also, thanks for the invitation to be here. Um, right, I'm going to talk less about the, the technicalities and a bit more about the political level um, that I'm facing in my current work. And um, to, to talk about that, I want to just briefly explain what I actually do, what this parliamentary inquiry is, um, how it works, and then give some examples of the findings that we've had uh, in the time that we have worked in this inquiry. and. Um, some of the of the outcomes uh, or the non outcomes that we've had so far. So, um, so what is the parliamentary inquiry on mass surveillance in Germany? Um, so the Snowden revelations uh, started pretty much uh, three years ago, in the beginning of June 2013. And um, in the late summer of that year, Germany had federal elections. So in September, um, we had elections. Before that, we had an election campaign, and the government was quite scared that the Snowden revelations would influence that a lot. Um, unfortunately, they didn't. But uh, because of the debate, uh, the whole parliament, which has a usually conservative majority currently, decided that still uh, it would be necessary to have an investigation um, from within the parliament uh, against the government to understand how Germany is involved in this whole system of mass surveillance and how much of this mass surveillance and is actually happening in Germany and how it is happening in Germany and what the government knew about it and uh, what it was doing about it. So this is basically the main task that we have as an inquiry. My job is to, I work as an advisor uh, to one of the uh, op two opposition parties um, in the German parliament. Uh, so basically what we as advisors do is we read a lot of files, we decide or we pre-decide, we prepare decisions on what topics actually to look at, what questions to ask, which witnesses to hear. Parliamentary inquiries in Germany have the big advantage of, of uh, following the, the idea that they should be as public as possible, which means that we call witnesses from the government, from the intelligence services, whoever we deem necessary, um, who like, a bit like in a court case, um, are required to say the truth, um, not by oath, but actually if they are caught lying, that can have heavy consequences. And uh, so what we do is that uh, after the, the committee started, which actually took some time in March of 2014, we decided what topics to, to start working on. And uh, of course, we wanted to understand what is the NSA actually doing, how much of what Snowden actually revealed was true, and what is the GCHQ's involvement, what uh, is happening at the undersea cables, and does Germany know, and which of these cables run through Germany, and who is accessing them where, and when, and how, and who knew about it. Um, very soon, we uh, were confronted with uh, some pretty heavy obstacles, as in that uh, both the United States government and the UK government basically told the German government, no, <laughs> we're not going to tell you anything about this. So we can require the German government to answer our questions, but we cannot require any of the Five Eyes governments to answer any of our questions. And uh, very soon after the beginning, um, basically, there was a pretty heavy threat hovering over the inquiry and saying, okay, this is really endangering the national security, this is really endangering the cooperation of intelligence services. If the Five Eyes intelligence services stop cooperating with the German intelligence, then we are basically left on our own facing the Islamist state and all the evil terrorists out there, so just be careful what you do and think of all these consequences. Um, that was pretty drastic. Um, being a very small committee, the committee is made of eight members of parliament and represent the, the majority in government, which currently we are having an 80% uh, majority of social democrat and conservative party representing the government and a 20% minority opposition of green and socialist parties. And uh, even while, though the, the government representatives in the parliament uh, still have this 
idea that as parliamentarians we control the government and of course we need to follow through with the ideas of the inquiry at the same time they are defending their government and not really going against what, what the government tells them to do. So basically that leaves us with two members of parliament of the opposition and a very small number of staff doing this kind of work facing those intelligence services and that sometimes is an interesting feeling to have. Um, so, while we requested the government to hand us files, and okay, maybe just to briefly illustrate that, it's not like an inquiry like ours, which is part of the parliamentary oversight of intelligence, uh, could, could go to the BND, which is the uh, Foreign Intelligence Service in Germany, Bundesnachrichtendienst, and just go and go through their files. What we do is that we say, okay, we want to investigate specifically any cooperation uh, relating to data interception on cables um, and we request all the files the government has on this um, relating to the five eyes and then the government go through their files uh, for a long time and eventually they hand us some files but we have no way of finding out whether this is all or, uh, or what's actually missing and then of course there is a high level of classification of documents that we cannot talk about in public and that actually also cannot be mentioned in public hearings but there is actually quite a bit that can be mentioned and uh, we've had a very good, I wouldn't say cooperation, but we've had very good coverage uh, by a number of media, namely the Süddeutsche and the Spiegel, who have been following these, these topics uh, along the Snowden revelations, but also uh, what's been happening in the inquiry. Um, and so we got a number of files, but um, most of the stuff on the direct cooperation was blackened. And also the German government feels that any documents that they have that relate to the cooperation with, for example, the NSA or the GCHQ, they cannot hand over to the parliament, the inquiry, but they need to consult with the US government and the UK government first before they can hand them over to us makes sense from an intelligence perspective because they have agreements, uh, non-public agreements between them, how they cooperate, but doesn't make a lot of sense from a democratic point of view when you consider that the parliament controls the government, not the other way around. And so the parliament, of course, would have to have access to whatever the government does specifically in cooperating with other countries. So it cannot be that the US government decides what the German government can see about what the, the German government does, but that's actually the way it works currently. Anyway, so that describes a bit why I think that there is, is a lot of the stuff that what Snowden talked about and that you have touched upon now that, uh, that we will not access during this inquiry, but there has also been quite a bit that we actually have seen. I think the, uh, the one operation that we found out about most is an operation uh, between the NSA and the BND, and uh, the basis of that came out because we started investigating the cooperation between them in a German uh, former military base, but Eibling, which used to be a US military base. The US pulled out of Germany uh, large scale after 9-11 because basically they reorganized a lot of, of their budget and uh, spent a lot less on these types of bases, more on other bases, but less in Germany, handed over this base to uh, to the German uh, BND, and it's a huge uh, satellite interception uh, facility. Uh, and so a lot of the cooperation that's happening there uh, is intercepting data from satellites. But what we actually also found, and here we come to the cables topic, is that uh, in Bad Eibling at the, uh, what's called the, the JSA, the, the Joint uh, S Signals something activity, I, sh I should look that up, I should know that, but anyway, JSA is, is like their joint facility that they're having, uh, where they actually hand over data, is, is not only handling uh, satellite data, but also there was a huge operation started in 2004 called the Iconal Operation, and this was quite interesting because it basically was uh, the BND uh, intercepting data at uh, a huge internet exchange in Germany, in Frankfurt, which is the largest internet exchange point in Europe, as far as I know, and the BND directly accessed cables there and handed over whatever they intercepted to the NSA. Of course, uh, they added some filtering there. Um, the really tricky part about this is that the BND is not allowed to intercept uh, data in Germany. 
um, specifically not of, of German citizens, but is allowed to intercept quite without much regulation outside of Germany. Pretty much like um, I think what's much more well known, the NSA uh, can do a lot outside of the United States, but not in the US. And there's always very tricky whether there's US uh, citizens data involved and the German intelligence goes by the same rules. And actually, I think most of the Western countries have similar regulations like this. So the BND is allowed to do a lot outside of Germany, but not in Germany, specifically not handling German data. And so the trick was, <coughs> um, I'm getting a really throat skin, so if, thank you. <laughs> so, so the idea was that they were intercepting cables that were actually transporting uh, non-German communication. So that was the idea, and here is where it gets actually quite interesting. How can they be so sure that no German communication was running through these cables? We're currently uh, trying to prove that they can't. Um, however, what happened, uh, and which is much more bizarre, uh, from a democratic point of view, and there's many of these kinds of aspects, is that basically the BND went to the German Telekom, um, accessed, uh, requested to access the cables, and that the German Telekom was a bit like, what? Like, <laughs> why? And what's the regulation behind this? And there is no law that actually allows the BND to do this type of thing. And so while they were still in the process of figuring out how, how to do this, the Telekom was ready to oblige because the government came and said, well, you know, in the interest of national security, this is a good thing. And the telecom said, yeah, but is there a law? And then, uh, <laughs> then uh, the BND said, can we just do this? And telecom said, well, again, asking the government, so what do you think? And the government literally wrote them a letter saying, this is okay. Just do it. No law. This is what happened. Um, and they went through with this, uh, working on test versions of this operation for several years. And in the end, uh, uh, testing, like, I think the, the most problematic thing for them was to filter out German citizens' data. We spent a lot of time on, on filter systems of intelligence services in the inquiry, having them explain to us. In the end, it turned out that that was not uh, perfectly possible to filter out German communication. This then gets very technical as in how do you actually define German communication? Is it German email providers uh, ending with the .de domain or is it uh, actually German language and communications? What about uh, German citizens of a Turkish origin who are in Istanbul using a Google Mail address and how do you actually, and writing in Turkish, for example, and, and how can you actually automatically define that this is German content? And that proved out to be very tricky. In the end, after four years, the BND decided this was too difficult for them to do and too on the boundaries of legality and the operation was stopped in 2008. And I think that's actually the reason why we heard about it and why we found out about it. We don't know how this cooperation continued after that. Um, we're still trying to find that out, uh, but this is just basically explaining one of the operations that was tested in 2004, and I'm quite sure that other forms of cooperation happened after that, but, but we just couldn't um, find out about them. Maybe it's a good operation to at least show that one thing that uh, all of you who saw Citizen Four uh, have heard in the movie, um, which I think is probably really true for all of these operations, is that the NSA goes around, offers countries uh, hardware and software in exchange for information. This is exactly what happened in Germany. Um, the BND always claiming to the German government, we don't have enough resources, we don't have this nice hardware, we really don't have this nice software, the NSA is offering that to us, we can really make good use of that. Um, and in exchange, we'll give them really well-filtered information, non, no German information in there. And I think you're fine. Um, and my guess is this is still going on, but we have little proof about it. We have no information about cooperations with the United Kingdom because the UK government is even harsher than the US government with regards to that. So we have very little evidence 
supporting what Snowden said, even though we believe that most of this is true. It's just very difficult to prove, even though we have a pretty strong instrument with such an inquiry, specifically compared to other countries. Uh, as far as I know, there is no other country who has done such a parliamentary inquiry like ours. <coughs> So the bad news is we have found very little to, to back that up. I think, the, on the other hand, um, one of the uh, high-ranking people of the NSA, I think it was Klepper last year at some point, said the parliamentary inquiry in Germany is more dangerous than Snowden, which made us proud. <laughs> um, I'm not sure that's true, but uh, it, it, it shows that uh, we made an impact um, and that they really didn't like or don't like what we do. And a uh, little surprise, any public debate about what intelligence services do is something that they really don't like. We have an ongoing debate in Germany about regulating uh, intelligence activities. The NSA at some point stopped the cooperation um, in Bad Eibling, which uh, from our perspective was a good move from the German government's perspective, was a really bad move. We keep having these debates about national security being endangered. Um, if this type of debate goes on, if more media leaks uh, are happening and many of the things that came out into the public uh, happened through media leaks because it was classified information and we we're not allowed to talk about them, but eventually uh, some of the news teams that are following this have been publishing information um, that the intelligence was really unhappy to have out in the open. But we had public debates about this um, that, that did have effects. Um, for example, about a year ago, we had a major debate about uh, the use of uh, selectors by the NSA that are basically search terms that are used to go through the intercepted huge amount of data to find targets. And uh, when that is described, you would think of the typical Islamist terrorist from somewhere <clears throat> endangering our security, and that's what they are using, and this is what the selectors are about, but it actually showed up that uh, a lot of the NSA selectors were uh, targeting um, German companies, uh, European politicians, a lot of uh, people and targets that should not be the target of uh, European intelligence services, even according to their own governments. Um, and the government had to admit that they had made major mistakes in their oversight of intelligence, and we've had a debate about reforming, uh, which might not come through because of our very hugely conservative government, but at least there has been a debate about these things, and uh, as well a debate about whether actually the BND is using also selectors against German companies and handing over this material to the NSA. So we've moved a bit away, actually quite far away from the topics of the Snowden revelations, but we're having an ongoing pretty strong debate about these issues in Germany at this moment. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to stop there. Uh, there's, I've done more than my time and there's a lot more to say about these things. Maybe if you have questions, I'm happy to answer those or let's see where we go in the discussion. I would say now let's pass to Fike Janssen and then we can open the debate to someone us and with the public. I'm going to remain seated, but can we change it to the website? Um, so when, with the first time I had a discussion with Tatjana about the internet backbone, uh, it was um, partly my own fascination, because on the one hand, I think um, we have the user uh, who, like Matt says, like our most like interaction with the internet is through our mobile phones or our computers. When you ask people to draw something, they draw a cloud. There was an entire uh, talk about uh, the cloud representation uh, two days ago. Um, but part of my other fascination with the backbone of our critical infrastructure, because you can say that the internet has become a critical infrastructure, is that um, in the 70s and 80s, there's been a huge privatization of our critical infrastructure, uh, where European governments have sold 
or given railway systems, telecom systems to companies. And I've always wondered why would you do this? As a government, if you want to control your critical infrastructure, why would you give it to a commercial company if it's that critical? So this uh, also sort of triggered my question into the internet as a critical infrastructure and if it was also privatized later on. And so when uh, I was looking for maps of how the internet started or to sort of see uh, what the undersea cables actually meant and how, where these internet exchange, po exchange points are, um, I found this great website, 40 maps to explain the internet. Uh, because actually we hardly ever think about the hardcore infrastructure that's behind it and how it actually got started. Um, so we might talk about the centralization of Google, but is there also centralization of infrastructure? I'll move a little bit closer to the uh, pressing down. So I'm not going to go through all 40 of them, but it's actually quite a good description of how the internet got started. Um, so the first is most people probably heard about it is um, ARPANET. The internet actually got started with ARPANET, which is a military network uh, to tie different bases together. And here you have Utah, uh, UCLA, so universities were included in this as well. So this is actually the first internet as we know it. Uh, this was sort of uh, funded by um, a collaboration between state and universities and also some companies. So actually, this already means that the internet was never public to begin with. It was always had commercial interest. Uh, and this is the actually the cable on the ground. And then ARPANET expands. So here it's sort of uh, on the one hand you have the west coast of the US and then it travels to the east coast to connect uh, more universities to it. Um, and maybe now it already starts to trigger why the US is also so dominant in the internet. Because actually a lot of the backbone got started there. And it goes international, which basically means that they, it wasn't sea cables yet, but they had satellite connections to uh, the UK and Norway. Um, and Hawaii to connect other parts of the world to the to, to the sort of the system that the US was creating. Um, here you see it growing. Um, it's still ARPANET, so it's still still officially under sort of uh, within the military of the US. Uh, and here is where it becomes the internet. So. Um, you actually see that here the first uh, first cables start lying into. I think they're moving out. And where it becomes actually more interesting is that um, this is where it actually changes ownership. So um, here the NS NSFnet, which is basically the research, research institution of the US, started creating uh, more of the backbone and they started um, trying to link supercomputers together. And before it was... Um, a sort of a network of cables that was mostly being used for research purposes and wasn't really user friendly. And while it moved to the NSF net, it actually started becoming user friendly because the difference here is where um, the, so I'll just call it the NSF. The NSF uh, actually realized that if you have all these decentralized networks, so this is also where it became decentralized, the opportunity for it to grow would intensify because uh, you individual carriers could create their own networks, and as long as you link these networks together, you would have one internet. Uh, and as an incentive for sort of commercial companies to start investing in these networks, the NSF said, you can also uh, try selling it for commercial purposes so that you will get more users and you can charge users a fee to enter this place. And here they say it becomes a global network which is quite interesting because the majority of the world is still left out. Um, and I think this is where it really becomes interesting because in um, Evan's talk he mentioned how something like 68 cables uh, enter the US and 48 cables at the moment enter the UK and the rest like are distributed around across the rest of the world. Um, but this also makes the NSA or have such a dominance over the network because they actually have physical access to most of it because it enters in their country or a, a partner country like the UK. Um, and you see Europe is quite connected. Um, I think there's this, is, I'm gonna skip down a little bit. I would recommend watching all these maps because it's a nice visual representation of uh, what it looks like. 
Uh, broad band spectrum. So now we come, this is part of the map that uh, Evan actually showed. And so in uh, when the NSF started um, taking sort of taking over the internet and pushing it for more uh, research and commercial users, this is actually where the main privatization happened. So here um, they encourage companies to start investing in the backbone, so literally the, the cables in the ground. Um, and unlike any other sort of critical infrastructure, that, that has always gone hand in hand with sort of regulation. So regulation around access, uh, regulation around maybe how things are distributed. So if you look at a railway system, there's a lot of regulation around who is allowed to access this railway uh, system. Uh, are there entry barriers? Uh, there's a lot of like um, regulation to make it a sort of a common product. But actually, uh, when the NSF started pushing it commercial, the entire legislation sort of stopped. Um, so what happened is that uh, there were three, no, five main carriers uh, that started creating their own network in the US. Um, and, and at the beginning, the NSF still had their own internet exchange points. So all these commercial companies had their own networks, but the American government was responsible, so the research institution was the owner of the exchange points. And what these big carriers did is that they created their own commercial exchange points. So not only did they start owning like part, of, like part of the cables, they also started owning the exchange points, which meant that without regulation and with access to sort of the cables and all the um, um, sort of the exchange points, they could actually route the traffic through the internet uh, to stop using public cables, but only use their own commercial cables. They could uh, prevent people from coming on their cables. Um, so this can, gives also a competition advantage. For instance, um, if AT&T wants to provide a quick service, they will, only, they will prioritize their traffic over traffic of customers that aren't AT&T. Um, and the last five years, discussions have started about net neutrality, but this is actually way after the internet actually got uh, privatized. So this is sort of like, okay, so from it was never public in the first place. So the backbone has always been commercial and it's very little regulation. Then how, well, we see that the, uh, the US and Europe have quite uh, some uh, centralization of power because the cables basically come into the country. And uh, from the Snowden files, we heard a lot about sea cable tapping, about direct access to the cables. So they still have access to these cables. But if these are commercial companies, then sort of what is the stick and carrot that the government has to beat and get access to it? And um, this is where another uh, revelation from Snowden becomes interesting. Because uh, on the one hand, they can um, force companies to give direct access to the cable. So what they do, I think in the Netherlands, they just make 100% um, copies of whatever flows through the cables. And then they later on think about how they can sort through it. Um, but what the, uh, what the NSA actually also does is they make packs with commercial companies. And one of these packs they actually make with Google. So it's not only about data copying, it's about a lot of other things. And under uh, US legislation, um, any government entity is allowed to enter into an agreement with a commercial company for research and development purposes. So it's an R&D contract. And under this contract, it stipulates that um, they will front the money for the R&D research. Uh, and the, the company is allowed to sort of have access to the staff and resources that this government body has. Um, and the only thing they will want in return, oh, and the company can then keep the patent of whatever technology or tools created. Uh, so it's an economic advantage. And then the only deal you have to make with uh, that government entity is that all the data that is collected during this R&D stage is that it, you share this with the government entity. So whether it's the uh, research council or in this case the NSA. So um, we all heard about uh, probably PRISM, about how uh, the NSA got access to the Google servers, but they actually have a lot of other deals with them as well, which are sort of legal deals. Um, so Google and the NSA also entered into this R&D uh, contract agreement, and it actually happened when uh, in 2008 Google got hacked by the Chinese. <laughs> so they found a breach in their uh, data center in Hong Kong. And uh, the Google engineers started researching it, and uh, they actually followed the trail to where this hack uh, 
lead led. So it was their Gmail uh, interface got hacked, but they didn't know how severe it was. And uh, they this they followed this trail all the way to I think Taiwan, and uh, there they entered into the server of this unknown entity that hacked the Google servers. Um, and um, there's a really gray area because if you, it's sort of like trespassing maybe you can compare it to, if you don't delete the data and you don't modify it, it's not completely illegal what Google did to sort of follow the trail of the hackers to the server and break into the server because they didn't change anything. So it becomes this really gray area apparently. Um, and so they found out that there was a massive Chinese hacker intrusion within uh, Gmail and they actually stole um, some proprietary software which has to do with uh, passwords. So the one account for everything of Google that got hacked by the Chinese hackers, uh, which gave them access to a lot of sort of G um, uh, Gmail accounts from also Chinese within China. So it also had a lot of political ramifications. But what was actually interesting is from this hack is that uh, they didn't know who did it, uh, but they did see once they hacked the servers of the hackers, if people can still follow me, uh, they saw that many other countries were also, uh, companies were also, uh, American companies were also hacked in total, I think something like 38. And uh, instead of like deleting it, they shared this information with the companies that were hacked so that people could take countermeasures, which is a good thing. And they also shared this with the US government. Um, and this, actually, this hack led to this R&D deal between Google and the NSA. So what the NSA said was, um, we will help you, we'll give you information about everything we know about these types of hackers uh, if you go into this R&D deal with us. And uh, it's a little bit obscure about what this R&D deal actually was between Google and the NSA, but from sort of statements around that time, um, the NSA said that they went into this R&D agreement to create a new um, network, um, network analysis tool. And Google said they would trade um, network data uh, to get uh, more details about these Chinese hackers who hacked their servers. Now what is um, sort of floating around from deducting the Snowden documents is that what actually happened was that uh, the NSA didn't want a copy of the data, they probably already had access to their server farms. Uh, what they were actually interested in at that time um, is to see how Google's network flows. So how does your data flow across all uh, the Google infrastructure? Uh, and from this you can, for instance, um, do uh, malware intrusion or hacking intrusion um, so that they could see when there was an anomaly in the traffic, uh, this was good for Google, so that you can detect whether, you, whether somebody's trying to hack you. Um, so it still sounds quite innocent, like uh, the Google and the NSA deals to figure out how the network flows, how the data flows through the networks of Google. So it's not personal data that they're copying, it's nothing. Um, it is suspected, so now I go in more suspicion and assumption, so it's not, uh, uh, I don't know, it happens in secret services, so you can never say for 100% if you're accurate. Um, but on the if you know how uh, network traffic flows, you can actually start developing tools to either monitor or intercept this network traffic. So there's two very, well not very, I think PRISM is probably the most famous program, but there's two other programs that look more at network traffic and it's uh, Turmoil and Turbine. Uh, and turmoil is basically detection of network patterns and seeing if there's an anomaly, which would be a very logical uh, tool that could get created from going into the Google uh, network traffic. Um, and where this becomes sort of scary is if um, there's been many talks and articles about uh, the NSA leaks and also about turmoil and turbine, is that um, not only can you detect network patterns, the other one also, if you combine them, you can detect network detect the network flow, capture it, and reroute it to pass an NSA server before it travels to wherever you want to go. So then it already becomes more scary because it actually becomes a weapon instead of sort of like a network analysis tool. Um, and so this is one part of sort of this deal between Google and the NSA on R&D. Um, and uh, Google got information about the Chinese hackers, so they were quite happy, I think. And the other thing that you see is, and I think this is also where I sort of push back to Matt's assumption that you can actually see companies as political entities and push them 
is that um, to be able to make this deal, Google also got something else in return, and that was that uh, one of the founders got a temporary security clearance. Uh, so he was able to hang out with Keith Alexander and get go to all these briefings about uh, cybersecurity attacks and learn more details about what the NSA knew about the attack patterns in um, to Google. And not only has uh, one of the founders got the security, temporary security clearance, but apparently a lot of sort of the big companies from Silicon Valley actually get this security clearance. So you become, you buddy up with the NSA and you actually get to see a whole lot, whole new stuff that you don't get to see before. So whereas if we are sort of from the NGO and the political activist side, we keep on pushing at the bottom of these really big multinationals to sort of say like, uh, you have to open up, you have to be more transparent, you have to fight back to the government, while the top level of these governments are being buddy-buddy with the top level of the secret services. And there's a complete power dimension, and I think we have to sort of acknowledge this. Like we have a power dimension within the network cabling infrastructure, uh, where most of the power lies still with sort of the, the US and Europe, uh, I think there's also quite a power imbalance with access and sort of what you can, what is the carriage you can hold in front of these companies to make them cooperate. That was it. Um, so first I would like to ask you if you have some question for each other <laughs> and then we open to the public because I think that we touch so many different aspects uh, that I guess that maybe you also are interested uh, on what the other was saying. I don't know, just a speculative uh, advice. Um, maybe, maybe to Anne. Okay. I was curious about the... Um, just the, the next stages of the inquiry. Is it, are you, is it like going towards a report to be published to the public, or is it more, are you on to another issue um, and you're not thinking about how you report this to the public yet? Um, well, we are confined to be done uh, before the next election, which is next year in September, so we're having a pretty clear time frame. We're doing uh, more public hearings and other topics until maybe January f of next year. Um, we've moved from the uh, foreign intelligence now to domestic intelligence. We're currently um, uh, investigating the use of X key score by the domestic intelligence in Germany, um, where we are being fed a story that uh, <laughs> that uh, there's only an isolated instance of X key score being used by the domestic intelligence. It's not; uh, they are not using the option to actually intercept data with X key score, but uh, they're actually only using it to analyze already intercepted data that they have uh, because uh, X key score is better able to um, to identify certain protocols than uh, than the uh, their own uh, software that they have been using so far. And because they are very uh, troubled about possible leaks of German data and the domestic intelligence is looking at Germans um, primarily or people in Germany, um, they uh, use this as a standalone instance that they are still testing for three years now. There is some questioning going on why they need three years to be testing um, a software uh, before they decide whether they want to use it, but but that's what we're looking at currently, and uh, and we're also um, looking into an aspect that's part of the task of the committee, which is how is this intelligence cooperation and and German participation in the cooperation being used in the drone war, which is a very uh, sensitive issue also for the German public because uh, Germany is not at war with uh, Pakistan or with Yemen. Um, and the idea that uh, German intelligence might cooperate in killing people in Pakistan is, uh, is tricky. Um, the government is trying to defend that uh, they're not actively involved in this, that uh, if they exchange data with the NSA, uh, they and, and this is like literally them saying that they always add a disclaimer that this information may not be used for lethal activity, uh, which, which of course uh, will definitely help <laughs> uh, no, so so that is uh, something that we're that we're discussing with them now we're hearing more witnesses about this 
um, and we're also investigating the the situation of the U.S. military base Rammstein, which uh, is a relay station for the drone war, um, and how this is legal for the German government to have that on German soil. Um, so there is more content in there that is uncomfortable for the government and that we would like to find out more and it's basically an ongoing battle whether we manage to extract information out of the witnesses that they don't want to give us. Um, so this is happening until maybe January and then what's going to be happening, we will be writing a report, there's going to be a public version of the report and there's going to be a much larger classified version of the report. The typical problem of parliamentary oversight in general, uh, most of the information is not public and will never get to the public um, and the parliament, a few selected parliamentarians will know about it um, and that's all that is ever going to be part of, of an oversight procedure and, and that is going to be similar with, with ours. We are also still trying to think of how we can include the UK in one way or another. Maybe we will talk about that after the panel <laughs> a little bit and, and what kind of witnesses, because we have been thinking about US and UK witnesses, but we're, we haven't even tried to call them because we're pretty sure the government is just not going to allow that to happen and what other witnesses would be possible to actually ask to give us information that is, is actually witness information from their own first knowledge. Um, and, uh, and yeah, well, the, the president of the BND has already been removed during the course <laughs> of the inquiry and uh, we'll see how much further we get. <laughs> Great, I just want to add the one thing and then we're really open to the public. Is there any form of public pressure that people could do to help the inquiry to get more documents that you cannot uh, get? Since now, you know, time is also running, I suppose that uh, for you would be really important to get as much as, uh, access to documents as possible. It would, of course, be really nice to have thousands of people protesting outside Parliament and demanding for more transparency in this. But um, I think we need to realize that time has passed in the past two years. Other topics like the refugee crisis in Europe are getting a lot more attention currently, and I'm like, that's fine with me. I think that's something that is important to be in the public debate. You cannot keep a topic like that up in the news for two years ongoingly. <clears throat> so, so interest in, in this whole issue of mass surveillance has decreased a lot. It would, of course, help if there was more pressure, but I don't think that's realistic to have. I think another problem is that Germany is the only country that is doing some, something like that currently. It would be really nice if other countries had similar procedures or debates um, because uh, that would help us put more pressure on the German government which already feels I think very torn between um, a, a parliament that has legal rights to certain investigations and the threats of the US and UK governments and, and actually I think yeah, that is also a question of how you would politically interpret that whether it's the German government that's scared of the US government or whether they are just really a staunch ally of the US government and the UK government and want to be part of that intelligence cooperation and find it extremely annoying that there is uh, this opposition pressuring them to release information that might endanger the cooperation, which is what we attempt to do. Which is already going to get me more like remarks and nasty files if I say that. <laughs> so I think now it's really time to open to the public. Uh, please, if you have any question, Joanna. Do you want to give them a microphone? Ah, uh, how can I I have, first of all, a great panel. It was, uh, it was really, really nice, so thanks a lot. And I have two questions that are very technical. <coughs> One is, I think, from Matthew. It's uh, what's happening with all this data they collect. In the UK, you say, like, all the centers that they are being tapped. Mm -hmm. Which data they collect and what they are doing afterwards with this data. Where is it going? Just for commercial purposes or just stays in the government, police, et cetera, et cetera. And the second one, I'm very curious if there is some sort of uh, international regulation on how, if you can just throw any submarine cable anytime you want, or you need to go through a procedure to ask like to an organization whether you can do it or you can't. That's the two questions. Thanks. Okay, I'll take the first one first. Um, so with the 10 thing, I think there's a, diff like, there's a few different ways that people have tried to explain it. 
But I think the best way you can look at it is that what Tempora was was like the first grab for all of the information that like each subsequent program would have access to afterwards. So you'd have something like, um, so you'd be grabbing at that level of the submarine cable, it's just all ones and zeros. It's like an incredible amount of like difficult information to parse. But then for something like the optic nerve program, which was the famous uh, webcam program where they were collecting um, 50 million uh, people's webcams every seven minutes, it would be, they'd be using Tempora, it would be buffering for the three days, um, they would sort it, they would say, well, this is webcam information that should go into the optic nerve um, retention suite, um, and then you can have it there, and that's where you'll be able to, to begin to search it. And that's kind of how it's supposed, that's the best way to, to look at a bad situation, that that first tap is like a kind of, it's the big grab first, and then you begin to siphon it off into different areas. And then it, it's retained for different periods of time based on that program as well. Um, but that immediate time is three days. Um, which is a significant amount. And it's a super interesting question, the second one, and there isn't a good answer unless, um, unless I'm mistaken. There isn't an international organization that, that regulates these providers. I mean, hands up who, who even heard of level three before Evan's presentation. Yes. Yeah, a few. But I mean, you guys are activists in the digital space. I mean, they are, they are the providers of millions upon millions of people's communications and no one's, like the vast majority of people have not heard of them. Um, and there's a big jurisdictional issue as well. Does the fact that Level 3 are a, a US company but they're running cables from Germany to, uh, to the UK, does the US jurisdiction mean anything? Does that, do they serve the order in the building in the UK or in Germany or should they be serving it in the US? And that's not clear like in the slightest. Um, but thinking on those levels is exactly where we have to get at and pointing out the fallacies of and the ridiculousness of the situation that we're in um, is where we at least begin to get a little bit more kind of clarity, I think. Just just quick and then I'm handing over to you. Um, as far as I know, and I'm not expert on international regulation of intelligence services, I'm focusing on ours currently, but as far as I know that uh, you often have regulation for police activity, but most of the intelligence services feel that as long as they're outside of their own country, they're out in the wild, they can do whatever they like, and this is how they act. Uh, and about the regulations of the sea cables, um, I I don't know. I'm also not a lawyer, so uh, mm. I've never looked at this. But I do know that um, putting these sea, ga sea cables in the ground or putting like fiber optic cables in the ground, it is a very expensive thing to do. So it's like, um, do they, uh, for instance, for the sea cables, do they apply? Do they have to apply for permission? I think so because there's no sea cables through the Antarctic, and I think this is a re there's a reason why there's no sea cables through the Antarctic. It's a really b like simple guesstimation already that there are some permissions you have to ask, and of course, as soon as it goes into uh, national waters, you probably have to ask the country for permission. Um, but what you can see is that actually the the it's so expensive that it's becoming this conglomerate of uh, like different entities owning one sea cable. So I think the sea cable between the US and Japan is like Google and five telcos, for instance. Uh, Facebook has a sea cable that's also with five telcos and Facebook. So there's like these uh, weird partnerships being created just to, to bear the expenses. And the sea cable that goes around Africa, I think it's partly paid for by the US, partly by Europe, partly by Google, partly by like, so it's like, um, yeah. And I think because it's such an expensive operation, they will find they they will ask for the proper permissions. Can I? Thank you. Um, one like quick remark. Um, of course, like in, in in our mind, it's expensive, um, but uh, return on investment on these cables is like I don't know within days. If you have yeah. the cable in the ground or in the sea. Within days, you get you have the return on your investment, and you start making profits. So I would say, like, uh, put that into perspective, and I say it's damn cheap to run these cables, and they are run like every day. Um, the other thing I wanted to say, mm, starting to think about it, um, I'm I'm going to make a claim, and I'm going to say um, the wiretapping is not going to stop; it's going to go on. Um, if um, like if you succeed in Germany, and and, and others will follow the um, the example around the world, it might be possible 
to stop um, the, the, all, all the intelligent agencies and maybe even get rid of them to do that. But um, as we saw with companies like Facebook, and um, I think Facebook is the biggest one, um, they, they, they have a business model that thrives on the data that the users feed to, um, to the company. And it's just like a question of time until somebody comes up with a business model to, um, to, to use the data that's running through their exchange points and to sell it to someone. So no, because now the technology is, is, is around to, to skim through the data in real time through like, I don't know, terabits per second and to analyze the, the data. And then um, there will be a customer and where there is a customer, there will be somebody who's willing to sell. So this is gonna go on and on and on until, I don't know, the infrastru infrastructure is uh, globally um, owned by the public and not by companies anymore. That's just a remark and maybe you have a comment on that. I don't know if you ever thought that far. Uh, I have a comment about the return on investment that uh, yes, the return on investment is really quick, but it still means you have to be able to to borrow this type of money. So if I would lay the C cable, the return on investment for me is not this quick. It is just as quick because these people own the data centers, these companies. So it's like a, a very different, it's a super centralized market. And it actually means that for newcomers, it's, uh, there's a very high barrier of entry. And um, so this is, um, so it's always the same players doing it. So this is why it actually is quite high, except for the players who are in it. Um, I don't know, I think, um, we already have a company who sell, who does this. They own some of the exchange points, they own some of the cables. It's the bi tech and biggest company in the world and it's called Google. So uh, I think there is already an idea about how you can mine this data and actually use it for a profit. Just quick, very convenient point here. <laughs> Um, uh, I, I don't think, uh, and I don't think you wanted to imply that, that anytime soon Germany is going to <laughs> stop the cooperation between intelligence services. And that very soon leads to a very pessimistic uh, debate about is there any hope in what we're doing or are we just doomed into total surveillance anytime soon or like f in the long run. And I think it, it looks like that. We don't have much hope currently that it we are going to have public infrastructure and that we can take all of this back and that we win the fight on mass surveillance. And when I get to that point, I often, um, I, I like to do a comparison to a situation in the 70s maybe in Europe when we were facing the threat of nuclear power. And I see some many similarities in that because currently when we discuss why don't people protest more, why is there no more public pressure and why aren't people interested, it's so dangerous when all their data go to the companies and all of that. And I think it's, it's uh, in a similar way, you can't feel it, it doesn't really hurt you, you don't really have a threat that uh, inhibits you in your daily life. And that is similar, I feel, to nuclear power in the 70s or 80s when people thought, yeah, well, but if you turn off nuclear power, then we need to go back to using candles for, for light and there just is no alternative to this. And people just felt we will never get rid of that. And that makes me think that uh, in the long run, we might be able to change this. It's going to be a very long fight, but we need to go there because we don't really have an alternative. We cannot just give in to this Orwellian perspective, but it's not going to happen tomorrow. I'm going to somehow try and be optimistic at the end of all of this. <laughs> <laughs> that was optimistic. That was super optimism there. Um, I think, so, I agree, the wiretap is never going to stop. Terrible beginning to an optimistic statement, but yeah, the wiretap is never going to stop. But the question becomes, like, what we try and create is a friction, an environment in which the wiretapping is not so, uh, so egregious and so mass that it takes all of our data um, and it takes every innocent person's information to, to, to become processed. And that, to me, does involve us making the service providers political actors. They are the last line of defense. Um, and it kind of goes to your point as well of like, there's these providers, particularly the over the top providers like Facebook, like Google, um, you know, th they base their business model on surveillance capitalism uh, for want of a better phrase, but I don't think there's a better phrase than surveillance capitalism for that kind of business. They don't want people to be freaked out by 
the potential for of surveillance. They want people to be kind of quietly just getting on and, and giving them information. And a Pew Research study in America a couple of weeks back showed that people had changed the way and were more wary about the kind of information they were putting online because of what they understood to be um, very broad surveillance powers and just the, the kind of Snowden effect. Um, that for if I was a Facebook executive or a Google executive, that's bad reading. You don't want people to feel weird when you're on your platform. You want people to feel like nothing at all. But to do that, you have to be showing yourself to be a responsible provider and one that is not going to use their customers' data to, to negotiate good political positions for their, for their executives. Um, and I think there's, there's something there. It's a weird, twisted argument that involves us still giving up information to them. But it does have an aspect to it that says Google understands that they need to create an environment where we feel that Google have our back, where we feel that T-Mobile are not just there to sell information and sell the last mile um, of, of wire to somebody, but are there to protect something. Um, and I think we might be moving towards that if, if, we, want, if we want to move towards that. Um, and that's, that's what excites me. Thank you. Other questions? I think uh, we are a bit out of time, but uh, I, I think we can still have a question, if there is. I think, no. <laughs> ah, there is one, okay. Um, do we, I mean, obviously, the information fitting the drone problem, um, war would be an example of where this information is used, but um, just, asking sort of a politically motivated question. Do we know of anyone in the West who has been arrested or had um, this kind of data surveillance used against them in their daily life? It's kind of a difficult question to answer because intelligence don't arrest people, right? <laughs> That's not their, their job. In the UK, they're not allowed to use anything gathered by, sorry. So in the UK, um, information gathered by intelligence purposes or through intelligence acts are not allowed to be submitted as evidence. So no one's ever had had that. It, it's a way to stop it being challenged, actually, which is a really difficult like process. So we can't answer that, um, unfortunately. Yeah, and I think, uh, except we're talking about sort of uh, on the internet backbone, but I think the... Um, story in the UK that broke a couple years ago. There's an interesting book called Undercover, and it's about a secret cell within the London Metropolitan Police Department who infiltrated the uh, Green Movement. And uh, through all throughout all this book, it was, it was quite interesting. It was written by... Uh, by the Guardian uh, to Guardian journalist, that never was any of this data used because as soon as it would be used, it would uncover the program. Uh, so you have an entire operation that is uh, completely destroying people's lives and that you can really question if you still live in a democracy and it's not being used because otherwise it would be exposed. So I think a lot of this, um, like uh, the other thing in the UK is quite interesting that you cannot use it in court of law because, I don't know, there's reasons for it. So, yeah. I mean, intelligence are claiming that they are using all this data to prevent all these terrible terrorist attacks. And I'm sure in most of the countries we have these kinds of statistics where intelligence are legitimizing their activity in, in saying we were able to stop this many attacks. But I think that was not really your question. But this is basically the goal of intelligence activity. 